So thank you very much everyone for joining us tonight on our uh, latest webinar. I think this is webinar number eight. Um, it's great to have you all with us once again. So thank you for supporting us. So just a few little pointers before we start. So the webinar has been recorded and uh, I'll put it on the YouTube channel, uh, hopefully over the weekend, which is the East Sussex I group. Um, there is CET points available for tonight's lecture. That is if you're watching via the live via the link on your email when you're registered. And the CET points are available for dispensing opticians and optometrists. The lecture will run for about an hour, but the, lecture, the webinar sort of the lecture will run for about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes for questions at the end. So at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, then please post your questions in there. And then at the end of the webinar, I'll aim to get through as many as we can in the time scale. So I'd like to welcome tonight's speaker, Mr. Kashif Qureshi. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at the East Sussex Healthcare Trust specialising in the management of complex medical retinoid disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as high volume cataract surgeries. For the past 18 months, he has been the clinical lead for the East Sussex NHS Trust, and he's also a member of the Professional Standards Committee for the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So thank you very much for tonight, Mr. Kreshe, and I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I will share my screen. Um, I've, I've also um, collected a couple more tools uh, since, since last year. Uh, one is um, this horrible acronym called GERFT, or Getting It Right First Time, which is this, um, this initiative about increasing capacity in, in, in the NHS, which I'm the clinical lead for in Sussex. And the other one is uh, a bit more importantly, um, uh, the ICS clinical lead uh, for ophthalmology for Sussex. So this, this is probably a bit more relevant to the optometrist because myself and um, the commissioners and other people will be working with groups like the LOC to transform the way eye care is delivered in Sussex in the future. Uh, changing the pathways, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, we're not talking about that tonight. What we are talking about is um, one of those pathways, actually, which is uh, minor eye conditions. And I put there in inverted commas because um, they're often not minor um, and they're quite major and require uh, a good thorough assessment and, and sometimes management um, in primary care um, or sometimes referral. Uh, into secondary care. So I will start, start at the front. Um, so corneal problems. So most commonly, um, and the things that we really worry about are um, corneal ulceration. Uh, and, and corneal ulcers can be various types. Um, some of them can be more serious than others, um, but um, particularly bacterial viral fungal uh, ulcers uh, need to be um, treated in a very, very urgent way and assessed very, very thoroughly and referred uh, promptly. In particular, um, contact lens related ulcers are a same day uh, referral. So it needs to be seen by the um, secondary care service um, the same day and treatment needs to be initiated straight away. Um, so risk factors, um, obviously contact lenses are a risk factor, but also patients who've got ocular surface disease, who've had um, eyelid diseases like entropions or ectropions are much more uh, likely to get corneal ulcers, patients who are immunosuppressed, but also patients who've got um, uh, sort of learning difficulties or dementia, accidentally poke themselves in the eye, it cause corneal um, abrasions, which then can become ulcerated and and abscesses, which are you know, very serious. The symptoms for these are um, pain, um, photophobia, a lot of tearing, the visual acuity is often reduced. And when you examine the patient, you see a, um, a very characteristic um, appearance of a, of a usually circular shaped ulcer in the cornea with fluffy um, inflammatory material within it 
And sometimes, as in this photo, one of the lower photograph here, you can see a, a hypopian as well. When you put um, fluorescein stainies in, you'll see a staining defect usually, uh, which represents where the corneal epithelium has been devitalized. Um, and that's why the um, fluorescein stains it. So, as I said, these patients need to be referred on the same day and seen on the same day. So, you know, if your patient hasn't been seen, then, you know, you need to pick up the phone and speak to the on-call uh, ophthalmology doctor and, 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 you know, arrange for them to be seen because they, they must get seen straight away. If you can, if patients are, if the patients you wear contact lenses are the ones who um, have a contact lens case, I mean, obviously daily disposable lenses, they don't, but if they wear uh, reusable lenses, ask them to bring their case with them because they're often very helpful to culture, center microbiology for culture to identify or isolate an organism. When they come to the trust, um, they're seen by one of the on-call doctors usually who will do perform a corneal scrape. So with a bevel of the needle, they'll, they'll um, scrape away at the base of the ulcer. And then they'll, um, well, in the, in, the, in the good old days, they'd um, uh, run the needle over the surface of agar plates and chocolate agar um, and, um, and then send them off to microbiology to see what they grow. Nowadays, they often stick it in a sort of broth solution and send it to microbiology or try and culture something. Um, once it's been established that this is an infective corneal ulcer, and usually we view ulcers that are bigger than one millimeter are ones that require treatment, um, then we would start them on treatment with empirical therapies, um, usually a quinolone, um, like lofloxacin or exocin uh, or moxifloxacin. Um, and we, we generally give a cycloplegic to the patient like mydrolate uh, because it relieves the pain that they get from ciliary muscle spasm. Sometimes you can give um, dual therapy in patients who you think um, may be resistant or have got a history of, of abscesses and resistance with a quinolone and a cephalosporin drop plus um, a cycloplegic. So how can you tell whether it's infiltrative or, or infective? The sterile ulcers tend to be less than a millimeter in size. They tend to be very peripheral in the cornea. There's minimal epithelial damage. So there'll be a very tiny stain. Um, there's often no mucus discharge, a lot less, sometimes no pain at all, and a lot less photophobia very little anterior chamber involvement and very and no lid involvement. But infectious ulcers uh, tend to have, tend to be larger, they tend to be more central, uh, they have a much more significant epithelial defect, um, often producing mucopurinone discharge, but not always. Um, the patient is suffering a lot of pain and photophobia. There's quite a brisk anterior chamber reaction and sometimes a hypopian and often uh, the eyelids are puffy and swollen and red as well as a consequence of it all. So um, sterile ulcers, um, these are very common actually. Uh, and I think, you know, we see these quite often referred um, via primary care into the hospital as a, a query of a corneal ulcer. Um, the most common um, are marginal keratitis, which are very commonly associated with uh, blepharoconjunctivitis. Very often these patients are not contact lens wearers and they have these sterile ulcers in the peripheral cornea, which are an inflammatory reaction to the presence of staphylococcal um, species. It doesn't mean it's an infection with staphylococcus, it's a hypersensitivity reaction. So it's an inflammation actually. Um, generally, there's usually about one or two millimeters of clear cornea between the ulcer and the limbus. Um, you can also get contact lens related peripheral ulcers, which is a staph colonization of the contact lenses, which cause small, very small ulcers in the peripheral uh, cornea. They've got very common anterior chamber reaction and often very uh, often no symptoms at all. Managing these is quite different. With marginal keratitis, um, you would treat well. In, in, the, in, the, in the first instance, you would probably treat with topical antibiotics and when the acute phase is better, so after a day or two of topical antibiotics, you can be fairly sure that the cornea is quite sterile. You can consider giving steroid eye drops and then it usually resolves very, very quickly within a week or two. In a contact lens related peripheral ulcer, 
Um, you obviously advise the patient to stop wearing the contact lenses um, and consider giving a quinolone drop until the epithelium completely heals over. Um, in the good old days, um, we used to give, um, actually treat these patients with uh, combination steroid and antibiotic drops like um, Maxitrol or Predsol N, I don't think that exists anymore now, but Maxitrol uh, would do and that will um, settle it down quite quickly. But you have to be quite um, confident that it's a, a, a marginal keratitis, but usually they're fairly classical in their appearance. And if there's no contact lens wear, you can have a fairly, um, uh, you can have a fairly, be fairly confident that it's not uh, um, anything that needs uh, uh, on, uh, um, treatment. So our questions just popped up. Uh, should optoms refer marginal keratitis on an urgent basis to hospital line service? Good question. Um, so it depends what you, your, your uh, definition of urgent is, I suppose. Um, I think if it's, if it's a non-contact lens related patient um, and it's a definite marginal keratitis, it's, it's quite clearly, um, you know, classical, um, we would probably still see the patient within two weeks, as, which is what we would consider urgent. We would probably wouldn't see it on the same day. Um, but we, they do need treatment. Um, in some areas where there are independent um, practitioners um, who opt on who can prescribe, they may wish to actually start treatment themselves um, and then review in a, in a week or two to make sure it's getting better. Um, and someone else has asked, Lucia has asked, um, lens cessation for how long or forever? Well, I would generally uh, advise the patients to stop wearing their lenses um, for a few weeks at least uh, to allow the cornea to, to completely heal and settle down. Um, and then when they do go back to wearing their contact lenses, I have a very, very thorough conversation with them about how they're supposed to wear their lenses and use their lenses. Um, and also when they start wearing their lenses to wear them, to gradually wear them in, don't start wearing them 12 hours a day as soon as they can go back to wearing their contact lenses. Contact lenses is great. Uh, obviously, um, but they also have great problems associated with them and contact lens, um, uh, you know, related corneal abscesses I've seen many times in my career are devastating. So, you know, they need to be um, aware that they have to use them properly. Uh, where are we? Right, um, adenovirus, keratic conjunctivitis. Um, is very, very, very common. It's usually quite seasonal, though. There are usually times of the year when it, when it, when it tends to get worse. Um, you, you see quite classically, uh, sort of, as Americans call it, pink eye. Um, so the eye is sort of pinky red with um, injected blood vessels. There's often very little in the way of mucopurulent discharge. The eye is just watery, very, very itchy, often, which people confuse with allergy. Um, and if you look at the cornea, sometimes they get these um, stromal um, epithelial sort of infiltrates um, which are present sometimes can affect the vision. So epidemic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis is incredibly contagious. Uh, it infects the upper, uh, the gastrointestinal tract and the upper respiratory tract. Uh, it causes red, redness, itchiness, irritation, photophobia, light sensitivity, foreign body sensation, blurred vision, sometimes the lid's very swollen, but you also can get um, chemosis as well. And classically, you see follicles um, in the conjunctiva. Um, sometimes you get a discharge, but if you do, it's clear or it's sort of mucus, which is sort of whitey yellow rather than green. Uh, and you get this epithelial keratitis. If you examine, if you palpate the lymph nodes in front of the, around the ear, sometimes you feel a lymphadenopathy and also under the, um, the jaw, you can sometimes palpate the lymph nodes. Patients often have had a fever and a headache and, and more than half of them, uh, the other eye gets infected as well because it's so infective, it infects the other eye. So this is another picture of adenoviral uh, conjunctivitis with a bit of chemosis in this patient. We can see, um, you know, it's just sort of pinky red. There is a bit of subconjunctival hemorrhage in this sort of case, but they're not sort of thickly, grossly injected blood vessels. It's just all generally red. And this picture is a great picture of follicles which show these sort of whitish lesions which like almost like grains of rice uh, within the uh, um, tarsal conjunctiva. 
Um, but it's a very, it's often a diagnosis made on the clinical history. The patient's had an um, upper respiratory tract infection and then they've developed this very, very red, sore, watery, uncomfortable eye. The thing about um, these patients that's important is, is to not keep seeing them. If you've diagnosed it in primary care and, and you, know, you feel quite confident based on their history, please don't send them to secondary care because all that will happen is that they'll come to the hospital and they'll infect everyone in the waiting room around them. So, you know, in, and certainly in your practice, don't bring them back for a review because then you'll likely infect yourself or your staff. Um, I tell this sort of amusing story that when I was a registrar at Moorfields or sort of fellow at Moorfields in the eye casualty, they had a special room for the uh, uh, adenoviral conjunctivitis, which was a sort of separate room in eye casualty that you sort of went in in a sort of hazmat suit and you sort of washed it all down afterwards and sort of nuked it as soon as you left it because it was you know, thought to be so contagious. Uh, you know, the patients were sort of painted with lamb blood and kicked out the door, basically, um, because, uh, you know, you just don't want them. You just don't want them around. Um, it gets better on its own. It often doesn't require any treatment. Sometimes just treat them for comfort with uh, lubricants. Um, very, very occasionally, these patients get uh, something called pseudomembranous conjunctivitis, and they get this horrible um, inflammatory membrane that grows on the tarsal conjunctiva, which is very, very sore. And in those cases, sometimes um, that we will see them in the clinic, peel off the, the um, inflammatory membrane and give topical steroids to settle down the inflammation. But, but you know, that's a sort of last resort, really. Corneal foreign bodies um, and foreign body removal. So for corneal foreign bodies are incredibly common. Uh, we see loads of these. Um, and you know, generally they come via uh, um, the accident emergency department, but sometimes they do come via the opticians as well. Um, and in the good old days, um, the A&E doctors used to take these out um, and remove the foreign body themselves with a needle. Nowadays, they're all a bit chicken and they won't do it. Um, so they will get sent to eye clinic and we have to, um, we have to take them out. Um, I think if you're um, a skilled optician who can use a slit lamp and you've got uh, competencies to do this, I see no reason why you can't do this. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. There's very little risk of you doing any damage. Um, and actually you save the patient sometimes a lot of pain and discomfort um, and a, a wait to be seen in the hospital uh, by, by removing it. So there are contraindications to doing this. Um, and the main contraindications are if the patient's got a high femur, which suggests that there's some larger traumatic um, aspect to this. If the patient's got a diffuse corneal opacity, because then there's a risk of this being an infected ulcer or a foreign body that's become infected and that needs um, treatment really in the hospital service. Um, if there is an obvious laceration of the cornea or sclera, then definitely don't poke around with it with a needle. Um, if the pupil is dilated or is slightly abnormally shaped, um, then again, that's indicating to you that there's probably been some sort of um, traumatic injury. Um, and if the pupil is abnormally shaped, either because of a traumatic mydriasis or that there might be some vitreous that's peaking the pupil. So have a um, be very, very suspicious of that. And also if there's a shallow anterior chamber compared to, particularly compared to the other side, you know that there's probably been um, a, a a perforation or a penetrating injury, which is why the anterior chamber is shallow. How do you do it? Well, um, you um, anaesthetize the eye with um, a topical anaesthetic, proximetocaine will do. You can use binoxinate or tetracaine. Get a 25 gauge needle, um, bend the needle so that the bevel is facing you. Um, before you do anything, make sure that the, um, the cornea, uh, there's no there's no penetrating injuries and no perforations by putting 2% fluorescein on the cornea and seeing it, making sure that there's no sort of washing away. So it's still negative. Um, as I said, bend the needle so that the bevel of the needle is facing you. And with the bevel facing you and with the needle bent, just use the needle like a spoon and gently dig underneath the edge of it um, to flick out the um, corneal foreign body. And at the end, check um, seedle sign. I think I'll see if this, hopefully this will work. I'll probably have to share screen. 
screen these old people using technology i think it's quite funny isn't it like me right okay so there we go so we can see uh he's got the bevel of the needle facing him there's a nice metallic foreign body and he uses the edge of the needle to just dig it dig 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 just sort of slightly flick at it there we go and it's off easy peasy Lemon squeezy. Right, let me stop that share, and then I'll go back to the other thing. I, I, I um, hasten to add, I don't expect, um, uh, you know, Optoms, you guys, to, you, you to have to do this. I'm just, if you wanted to do it, I, I'm just sort of showing it to you to show you that, you know, actually it's something that I think you, you can do, and if it's sort of commissioned that way, then it's something to consider. Um, Calasians, um, very, very common, incredibly common. In fact, I get many referrals about these every day. In fact, today I got another referral and the comment from the GP was, patient saw the optometrist who advised uh, a course of oral antibiotics. And if it doesn't improve with oral antibiotics to then refer to the trust. Um, I'm interested to know what the optometrist thought oral antibiotics are going to do, uh, because they generally don't treat Calasians um, because it's not an infection. Um, uh, they can be given in certain circumstances um, to reduce ocular rosacea, but they're not, they don't treat calasians as such. So what is it? Well, it's an inflammatory lump in, uh, that's formed in the meibomian gland, a lipogranuloma. And it happens because the meibomian gland gets obstructed in patients who've usually got pleuritis. And um, there are sort of retained secretions of the gland that get stuck in the, in the lump and the, the lump gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and how do, how do you make it better? Well, using a hot compress on the eyelid, not a cold compress. This is what some other patients have told me. They've been told to use a cold compress on their eyelids. Cold compress will do nothing. You need a hot compress to uh, melt the uh, waxy, oily material in the lump and then um, you advise the patient to um, press on the, on the lump, massage the lump, and try to sort of milk out the secretions. And at the slit lamp, I've done this quite often, um, you can actually squeeze the lump. And if you look at the meibomian gland, you can see sort of toothpaste of, of sebum, sebum coming out of the, um, of the meibomian gland sometimes. Um, if you get this, if you get these sorts of things are frequent and in the same recurrence, then you do need to be quite careful and consider this a diagnosis of sebaceous cell carcinoma, although that's very, very rare. Um, if they're small and they're asymptomatic, then you can just leave them alone. They generally won't cause much of a bother for people. But if they're bigger, then as I've said, hot compresses, um, massaging. You can use antibiotic drops and ointment, which what that will do, it won't reduce the lump particularly, but it reduces the bacterial load that exists on the surface of the eyelid. Because remember, this all happens because your meibomian glands are producing more oil than they should. The bacteria that live on the skin then proliferate and, and the excess bacteria then cause localized inflammation, which then plugs up the meibomian gland. If it really doesn't go away, and I think it's um, after six months now, the CCG will fund them to be uh, removed um, surgically. So an incision in curatage where we uh, make a, a a little cut in the eyelid. Uh, when do you consider incision and curatage? Yeah, um, yeah. So as I said, the CCG won't fund it um, until they've been present for about six months. Um, my own view is that um, I think that you know I'd give them about three months to to get better, and if they don't get better, then then they're likely to need 
um, incision and cure task. But as I say, the, the, the CCG may not accept uh, those referrals and those referrals may get rejected at source. Um, you can give steroid injections to these patients. So um, trimcinolone or Kenalol injections to reduce the inflammation sometimes, but we tend not to do that. Um, on the whole, the vast majority of these uh, tend to get better uh, on their own um, and with a bit of um, massage. Um, what is very good, oh, there's a lovely example of a Calasian. Um, what is very good is, um, I don't know if I've mentioned it somewhere else. Uh, no, is um, for the hot compress is to use um, eye bag. Eye bag is this device, which is like a microwavable heat pad. You stick it in the microwave, put it on the eye um, for about five minutes. It heats up to about 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, and that's very effective at, um, uh, at heating the oil in the, in the gland and then you do the massage. Um, and, you know, as optometrists, you can actually sell this in, in your practice. And it's, it's very, very helpful, actually. It's not, you know, it's a very good thing to do. So my cat is trying to cat bomb the talk. Hello, Violet. Yes, hello. Um, so hordeolums. Um, so these are inflamed um, meibomian glands, basically. So internal hordeolums are where the meibomian gland itself on the inside of the eyelid becomes inflamed. And then you get purulent material released from the conjunctival surface. And then you get staphylococcal overgrowth and then a sort of infection like a localized cellulitis. And this is where you can give um, uh, uh, oral antibiotics because you want to prevent the cellulitis from getting worse. Um, Elian's uh, made the comment about IPL. Yes, absolutely. IPL is, um, and, and these sort of lipid flow and all those sorts of things are becoming more and more um, uh, more available to treat these sorts of conditions. Um, an external hordeolum, uh, which is actually in a blockage of the gland of Zeiss or gland of mole, where you get permanent material released from the outer lash line. Um, do Calasian start as hordeolums? Uh, no, actually, they don't. They just they just start as localized inflammation, and then they can become hordeolums in time. They they don't always get fully inflamed. Sometimes you can just get a painless, non-inflamed lump um, in the eyelid. Uh, that's an external hordeolum in in the lash line. Uh, blepharitis. So talking of um, IPL and lipid flow, blepharitis is um, incredibly common um, inflammatory condition affecting the eyelids. And I, I would wager that most of the red eyes you will see and, and irritable eyes that you'll see in your optometry practices will be because of blepharitis of one sort or another. Um, it causes this irritation, um, discomfort, redness, itchiness, um, and there are different types of blepharitis, and this is one thing that's it's often um, forgotten. So you can have anterior blepharitis, which in this picture is a great example of that, uh, where you get uh, bacterial, usually staphylococcal, or uh, a seborrheic dis disorder of the sebaceous glands, and you get these little crusts appearing on the, on the eyelashes, at the base of the eyelashes usually. And then posterior blepharitis, which is my, my bamian gland dysfunction, where you get a breakdown of, of the meibomian lipids, you get um, uh, abnormal secretions, um, and you get uh, unstable uh, tear film. You know what, I, amazingly, I'm on call tonight and someone's phoning me. Um, bear with me one moment. Hello. Hi, Switch. Hello. Can, 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 um, okay, yeah, sure. Well, if, if, if he can call me back in about half an hour, I'm just busy at the moment, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll speak to him. Okay, thank you. On, 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 this mob on this personal mobile, yeah. Thanks, bye. Sorry, consultant's job is never done. Um, so, blepharitis, um, it's typically bilateral, not always, but it... it it can be asymmetric, uh, but it's usually bilateral and it's often chronic. The patients don't often realize they've had it, but, but it can, it's usually long lasting and they probably had it, but they didn't realize. 
Um, patients often have dry eye disease in, in 50% in the, of, of the staphylococcal patients, uh, 25 to 40% of seborrheic patients. And, it, and the posterior blepharitis is the leading cause of dry eyes because of the abnormal uh, tear um, uh, quality. Um, sometimes you can get demodex um, infestation related to, to blepharitis. So demodex is a little mite. Um, and um, it can often be related to seborrheic skin conditions and ocular rosacea. So people who have quite oily skin or people who have ocular rosacea where they get a, a sort of acne type appearance on the sort of malar distribution of their, of their face. Um, and contact lens, long-term contact lens can be a factor in developing blepharitis. Signs of blepharitis, so anterior blepharitis, you get uh, lid margin swelling and redness. Uh, crusting of the anterior lid margin and scales at the base of the eyelashes. Often they get recurrent styes or, or um, you know, um, myobamine cysts. Um, they can get conjunctival redness and hyperemia. If they get demodex infestation, it causes a sort of collarette type, um, like a cylindrical collar further up the lash. And um, they can get sometimes secondary uh, punctate epithelial erosions, marginal keratitis, corneal panis, and sometimes corneal neovascularization if it's a very chronic, long standing um, blepharitis. Posterior blepharitis is, is a bit different. So you don't tend to get the, the crusting uh, around the eyelashes in particular, but what you get is this these thick secretions at uh, the meibomian gland orifices and what we call inspissated glands. This is where um, the inspissated means thickened. So when you look at the meibomian glands, you see this thick sort of oily, white waxy material plugging up the uh, orifices of the meibomian glands. And if you put gentle pressure on it, sometimes with a cotton bud or your finger, sometimes the oil just squirts out or the sort of sebum squirts out. Um, often they're associated with chalasia, can cause dry eye, as I said before, and you get secondary corneal signs similar to anterior. Management, um, so lid hygiene, very, very important. Um, so using um, wipes to wipe away the bacteria in the deposits, uh, a wet, warm compress will loosen the cholerets and crusts in, in anterior blepharitis, and in dry, um, warm compress will melt the uh, meibomian secretions in posterior blepharitis. And this is why I said 40 degrees for more than five minutes with an eye bag helps uh, manage that really well. Um, pharmacologically, you can treat the sometimes staphylococcal and separate may benefit from topical antibiotics, as I've said, um, to reduce the bacterial load. Posterior blepharitis, systemic antibiotics, such as do doxycycline or tetracycline, um, usually for about three months. It can be helpful um, if nothing else has worked. But as I said, it's not because you're, you're treating an infection, it's because these antibiotics have an immunomodulating effect on the surface of the eye um, as much as anything. Uh, herpes keratitis. So um, this is a primary blepharo uh, conjunctivitis with lid vesicles and it's rare um, for people with um, chicken pox to get corneal involvement um, and, and it's a sort of common misnomer from GPs that kids have got uh, chicken pox and the vesicles are near the eye therefore it will go on the eye and somehow it will infect the surface of the eye that's not how it works herpes virus lives in the in the nerve and it infects along the nerve roots so it's not going to spread from one tissue to another like, like that Epithelial keratitis, this is um, a commonly um, what we know as dendritic ulcers, which we can see here, these classical branching patterns. Um, and these patients uh, will complain of um, a gritty foreign body sensation. They'll often say like glass has gone in my eye, uh, very light sensitive, blurred vision. Uh, and when you examine them, um, before you put your topical anesthetic in, if you get a little wick of of uh, tissue and you touch the cornea, get the patient to look in the other direction, touch the cornea, they've often got reduced corneal sensation. Uh, when you put um, fluorescein in, you get this um, classical branching dendritic 
um, ulcer. Discoborn keratitis is a bit different. It's an endothelial keratitis and, and you get these circular areas of endotheliitis which cause corneal scarring. Discoborn keratitis is, is, is more common in patients who've had um, uh, epithelial keratitis in the past and then it reactivates to cause uh, endothelial uh, keratitis and inflammation inside the eye, and it can be recurrent. How do you treat these? Well, epithelial keratitis needs topical antivirals for about 10 to 14 days. Um, it is oral antivirals like uh, acyclovir are as effective, um, but without uh, corneal toxicity. So you can actually give oral treatments instead. Um, Acyclovir and gancyclovir are equally effective to treat epithelial keratitis. Uh, discoform keratitis, so um, you would treat these differently. So you treat them with steroid eye drops, uh, which sounds counterintuitive because this is a virus, so you think that might make it worse. But you give an antiviral topically and or orally, and then over time you taper off the steroids. Endothelial um, Discoform keratitis, remember, is an in, really an inflammatory uh, problem rather than a reactivation of the infection, although sometimes it can, the infection can reactivate. So that's why it's a good, good idea to cover with all, all topical um, antivirals. Uh, oral acyclovir, it probably has more benefit as the topical acyclovir doesn't penetrate the intact cornea as well. And once it settles down, these patients benefit from a prophylactic treatment, 400 milligrams twice a day for one year, reduces the recurrence of discoform by about 50%. Episcleritis, again, very, very, very common, um, usually self-limiting, um, usually doesn't need any treatment, sometimes it does. Um, it can be nodular or simple, and if it's nodular, you see a sort of elevated sort of lesion um, within the episcleral plexus. Um, mostly, the vast majority are um, idiopathic, which means there's no obvious reason for it, but about 35% or less have an associated systemic vascular order, disorder or a systemic inflammatory disorder like rheumatoid, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, and psoriatic arthritis. Um, there's often um, vascular congestion of the episcopal scleral plexus uh, and the episclera and the tenons is infiltrated with inflammatory cells and the sclera is spared. So you get this sectoral redness. So one sector of the sclera is red with or without a nodule. Um, and, um, but with scleritis, which is very different, the sclera becomes rather sort of purple in color. And, it's, um, and it generally is more generalized than episcleritis, whereas you know, that's in one sector usually. There's a lovely picture of it, and you can see the blood vessels in the episcleral plexus are, are inflamed and gorged, and there's probably a nodule in there as well. Um, how do you diagnose it? Well, if you put a drop of 2.5% phenylephrine in, it will blanch the conjunctival and episcleral vessels, but does not affect the sclera. Um, and the 10% will, will, will blanch the episcleral vessels, but not sclera. If you leave it alone, Generally, they resolve on their own. Um, oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen can be used. There's no evidence that topical non-steroidals help, but they, they might do. Topical steroids can help um, if they're particularly um, resistant and they're not going away and the patient's getting up and discomfort with it. But beware that sometimes when you stop the steroids, it just flares back up again. Generally, these patients don't need follow-up. They just get better and then you can discharge them. Acute angle closure and in brackets glaucoma uh, and it, it's in brackets because glaucoma is the consequence of it. Angle closure is the what actually happens. So this is an emergency, as you all probably know. This is something that needs to come straight to the hospital immediately. Um, you know, do not pass go or collect two hundred pounds on the monopoly board. They need to be straight in, and if it means a blue light to the hospital, it so be it. Um, the patients are experiencing severe pain like they've never had before. Often, they're often sick with it. They're vomiting with the pain. 
the vision is dramatically reduced. And when you examine them, the pupil is fixed and mid dilated. It may be preceded by uh, episodes of halos or rainbows around lights in the um, uh, preceding days or weeks. Why does it happen? Well, it's more common in people who've got short eyes, hypermetropes, people who are older, and that's because the cataract, as the cataract gets bigger and bulkier, it tends to push the lens iris diaphragm forward, which is what this diagram shows, and that then closes the um, pushes the iris up against the, anti the uh, trabecular meshwork and increases the risk of, of angle closure. It's more common in women than men, probably because women live longer. Um, and um, there are certain races who are much more likely to get angle closure, which is slightly counterintuitive. So really it's um, Asian, Southeast Asian races, Chinese races tend to be more, and Eskimo tend to be much more prone to getting it because they've got much uh, um, shorter eyes um, phylogenetically, although they become myopic because of their um, culture. Uh, these are lovely pictures of rather mangled eyes as a consequence of angle closure. The one on the furthest left shows a sort of distorted pupil as a result of um, uh, iris muscle ischemia with patches of atrophy, and they've had a peripheral iridotomy there. Um, middle picture is of um, glaucoma flecken, which is the uh, which is sort of ischemic damage to the lens capsule, and the last picture on the right is um, someone someone poor, poor unfortunate sod who's had the, the biggest peripheral iridotomy I've ever seen. Um, it's a bit overkill that, to be honest. Um, but when the important thing about these patients, um, from your perspective, is the send them to the hospital as soon as humanly possible. Um, so to, because it's almost directly proportional, the amount of time they have angle closure um, versus the amount of vision that they lose. So the pressure's usually, you know, well over 40, sometimes 50 or 60. Um, and the quicker they can get to hospital, the quicker the pressure can be brought down uh, and the, the, the more likely they are to um, uh, regain some sight and, and, and not have any permanent vision loss. Um, how do we treat these? Well, um, acutely we would give um, oral or intravenous if they're vomiting a lot, um, dimox or acetazolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, probably um, one gram, 500 milligrams orally, um, and then recheck the pressure and, it, and, and hope that it, it drops. Uh, when the pressure drops a bit, we can then start plow, plow, plowing in um, topical pressure lowering agents and pilocarpine to try and constrict the pupil. And ultimately these patients need a peripheral iridotomy or they need cataract surgery as soon as possible. Um, the game has changed a bit with um, primary angle closure or patients at risk of angle closure. In the past, we used to do a lot of peripheral iridotomies for these patients. Now we don't do so many. If they've got any visually significant cataract, it's better to take the cataract out and put a new lens in, which, which um, then prevents them from getting angle closure. And studies have shown that, I think the Eagle study showed that patients did much better at having cataract surgery early versus having a peripheral iridotomy. Um, anterior uveitis. Um, so again, quite common. Um, and um, it can be a part of many different disease processes. Um, it can be acute, it can be chronic, and it refers to inflammation of the anterior uvea, which is the iris and the ciliary body. Um, it can be associated with a systemic disease, but it also can be, uh, can be isolated. More often, it's isolated. And patients who have um, the genetic marker HLA B27 have a much higher risk factor. And these pictures, you can see the top picture is a patient with anterior uveitis with posterior synechi, um, you know, which is quite, quite unpleasant. There's probably fiber in there as well. And the bottom picture is these are what we call mutton fat precipitates, um, which are uh, granulomas actually, and, and they're a sign of granulomatous inflammation. Uh, so there's a question, patient with narrow angles and progressive cataract, will they get priority for surgery in intraocular lens? Um, depends. 
Um, if they've been symptomatic of, um, you know, uh, angle closure, then yes, they definitely will. Or if they've got signs of creeping primary angle closure where the pressures are a bit high, so they've got sort of ocular hypertension because of narrow angles, then yes, they definitely will. Um, uh, but uh, they otherwise they might not. If they're completely asymptomatic, it will probably be fairly routine. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, examination. Um, so um, these patients, anterior um, they'll have a lot of pain, photophobia, redness. Generally, the pain is a sort of aching, throbbing pain, like I've been punched in the eye. That's what people say very commonly. Uh, they're very light sensitive. The eye is very red. So they have this intense um, injection around the limbus, which is what we call ciliary flush. Um, <clears throat> make sure you check the visual acuity examine the anterior chamber, looking for cells floating around in the anterior chamber, keratoprecipitates, flare, hypopian, iris nodules, um, synechi and, um, and fibrin. Check the pressure. Sometimes it can be very high in these patients because of all the inflammation. And in all cases, you should dilate these patients and look at the um, posterior segment to ensure that it's not involved. Um, and there's no associated cystoid macular edema or, or intermediate uveitis. How do we manage these patients? Well, we give them topical steroids uh, and uh, a cycloplegic. So we generally start hit them quite hard with Predforte um, hourly for, a, for two or three days and then reducing over a six week period with a tapering dose. If it's very, very severe, if it's a lot of fibrin and, and flare and, um, you know, at the outset, you might consider giving a, a subconjunct, well, we might consider giving a subconjunctival injection of, of um, uh, a steroid. Uh, and obviously refer these patients unless you're super confident. Um, but um, and, and in terms of re referral, we generally would see these patients, you know, within uh, a day or two where we can where we can accommodate them. Um, flashes and floaters. Now this is this is uh, uh, a very important um, topic because this is so so common um, and we get so many referrals all the time from optometrists in, in primary care but also from MEX um, and um, it's it, it's difficult because it's a, it's, a tr it's a tricky area but you know it, it, with some simple rules about how to manage these patients here it, you know it could help the patients get the appropriate treatment when they need it and when they don't need it to get the reassurance but it just requires confidence from from yourselves um, but also uh, from us to give you that confidence in terms of how we manage it so what is a posterior vitreous detachment uh, it's a very confusing thing for people uh, including ophthalmologists the number of patients i've seen who've been diagnosed with a posterior vitreous detachment and don't have one um, they have cinoresis um, is, is amazing. Um, it's the separation of the posterior vitreous cortex and the retina. So the vitreous is attached strongly to the vitreous base, which is uh, anteriorly around the aura serrata. It's also attached to the optic disc margin and to the macula and around retinal vessels and in some areas of the retina, which is what we can sometimes see as lattice degeneration. And what happens with people as we get older, everyone, this happens to everyone, the vitreous becomes more liquefied um, and forms pockets of liquid water. And then what happens, and this is the key thing, is that the posterior hyaloid face, so the back of the vitreous sac, it ruptures, it splits. And then this liquid that's within the vitreous cavity then pours between the vitreous and the retina and separates the vitreous from the retina. Uh, and this becomes symptomatic when the optic disc attachment separates and then you and then the patient often sees a big floater uh, which is the white ring so this is a beautiful picture of a uh, of where the vitreous cortex is separated from the um, retina it hasn't completely separated at the optic nerve head and you can see it's still slightly attached at the base of the optic cup um, but that's a, a lovely picture of an OCT of, of uh, a vitreous detachment in evolution. 
Where there is traction at sites of the firm adhesions, usually in the peripheral retina, is where you may get a retinal tear, and then that may develop into a retinogenous retinal detachment. Vitreous detachments are incredibly common, and this is a really important thing to emphasize. So if you looked at all people over the age of 60, more than 50% of them have a posterior vitreous detachment. Um, if they're, sudden, if they're new in onset, patients tend to notice flashes and floaters in their vision. Um, and you know, they'll describe the floaters in various ways. How do you examine these patients? Well, using um, you can use an indirect ophthalmoscope and indent if you can, if you can do that. Sometimes we do that. You can use um, a slit lamp and use a three mirror uh, contact lens on the surface of the eye to look at the peripheral retina with the, with the peripheral mirrors. Or you can just examine the patient as fully and well dilated with a 90D lens or superfield or equivalent type lens. If a patient's got a vitreous hemorrhage in the eye, then there's probably about a 50 to 70% chance that there's a tear um, somewhere. And if you can't see it, then um, the, uh, you, you know, you either look again or consider referral. Now, if those patients, um, you may well want to consider, uh, I might want to consider indenting them to see if there's a peripheral tear. Uh, there's a question, will all new acute PVDs cause symptoms of flashes and floaters? Not always, um, but the vast majority do. Um, but some people just don't report it or don't notice it for some reason. So these are two photographs. Uh, so the one on the left, this is a round retinal hole that we can see there. And you can see this sort of pale object next to it is in a, a perculum. So that was what was in the hole and plugging the hole before, and it's got pulled off like a plug, pulled out of a plug hole. And what's happened is over time, that has shrunk a little bit and sort of um, shriveled up. So it's smaller than the hole that it's produced. On the right, this is a retinal tear. So you can see, and there's in fact localized detachment associated with it. So you can see a, a, a horseshoe shaped tear in the retina and then um, fluid has got in underneath and that's peeled the retina off a bit. The importance of, of these pictures is that a retinal hole doesn't require treatment and there's the risk of them developing a detachment is extraordinarily low. The reason is because there's no traction on the retina in this patient. So the traction has gone because the uh, traction has caused the, the operculum to get pulled off and then the vitreous is no longer attached to the retina. So that round hole would just stay there. Um, and it is difficult because and my ophthalmology colleagues in the hospital, particularly my junior colleagues, are forever lasering these, but there's no reason to. They won't de develop into a detachment. Whereas the one on the right, um, that needs um, addressing because there's ongoing traction where the vitreous is attached to the, um, the apex of the, the horseshoe tear and it's, it's pulling. And because it's pulled, it's, it's pulled the tear in and the liquefied vitreous has got in underneath and is lifting the retina off. And I think that is about it. That's all I've got to say at the moment. Um, thank you very much for listening to me from sunny or not so sunny Hawkehurst. Um, so I've answered some questions that have gone along, which is probably going to annoy Ian because he was wanting them to be at the end. But if there are any other questions, um, please, please um, don't hesitate to ask. And I would emphasize, don't be shy because this is where we get so many referrals like this. Um, and it's important that we, you know, you, you're clear in your minds what you can and what you can't send. But what I would say is if you've examined the patient dilated with a 90D lens or something like that, there's no Schaefer cells in, in the vitreous. Um, you have about a 90% chance that that patient has not got a retinal tear and they do not need to come to the hospital. What you can do with all these sorts of things is safe, safety net the patient. So you can warn them. You can say that if you get an increase in your floaters or an increase in flashes of light, then you need to um, seek advice at the hospital or your practice again to have another look and see whether a tear has developed. Remembering that patients who've had a vitreous attachment, the risk of a tear is much higher in the first six weeks of the um, vitreous separation. After that, the risk actually goes back pretty much to normal.
I'll shut up now. Sorry, Ian. <laughs> you've, you've, you've saved me a lot of work there because I normally read the questions, but I think sometimes it's important to answer the questions as you go along. Uh, if anybody else has got any questions, if they want to ask now, otherwise I know Mr. Koresh, you're expecting a call shortly. Um, oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I probably sound terrible because I didn't answer his question, but it's, I'm sure it will be, it won't be. It's a, it's a junior that tends to ask me questions about every patient he sees, so he can wait um, half an hour. Uh, uh, there's no questions coming through, so I would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for a, a fantastic talk again, um, and thank you for taking the time to, to present this to us tonight. Um, I will try and get the CET uploaded over the weekend, but I'm, I'm working, the hospital's quite busy, I'm working uh, this Saturday, so it might be early next week that I get the, uh, the CET uploaded and the YouTube video as well. And somebody's just asked the questions. Oh, uh, thank you, excellent content. <laughs> somebody's put there. Thank you very much. Really I've said there. So um, thank you all again for watching for tonight. Um, the next webinar I've applied for CET, but I won't advertise it until the CET is approved by the GOC, but keep watching on the, um, on the WhatsApp group and I, I will post it as soon as uh, CT is approved and I've set the, the Zoom uh, webinar up. But um, I'd like to say thank you very much again, Mr. Cresci, for, for that talk. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for watching and keep uh, keep your comments coming through on the, you, you, the WhatsApp group. And um, I think we'll, we'll call it a night. So thank you very much and see you all soon. See you soon guys, take care, have a good evening. I think I've ended it.